This is Criteria. Hey everybody, welcome back to Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast. I'm Thomas Miras, here with my co-host James Mievsky. Hello. Hey Thomas, hello everyone. And we are today going to discuss one of my favorite movies, Where is the Friend's Home? Uh, along with uh, the two two movies that followed it in a sort of a trilogy that emerged uh, because these these films were set in the same region, the co- known as the Coker Trilogy, by the great Iranian director Abbas Kiarostami, and um, there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, I think we'll we'll focus more on the first movie because that's the one that I've seen the most times, and that's my my personal favorite of his films that I've seen so far. Um, but just to tease that a little bit before we get into introducing the director, the film is a very beautiful, uh, simple story about uh, a young schoolboy who accidentally brings his uh, his classmate's workbook home with him. And in order to uh, save that classmate from getting in trouble for not having done his homework because he's pretty much on his last straw before getting expelled, he decides to go to the neighboring village and search for his friend's house to try to give him his workbook back. So there's this sort of story about conscience and all these different things that come up uh, from the perspective of a child. Very beautifully done. Thomas, you, you introduced yeah. this as where is the friend's home, whereas, you know, a lot of times it's listed as where is the friend's house. Is there a reason why you... There's just different, you know, I think on the Criterion... Uh, the Blu-ray set, it's Where is the Friend's Home. You might sometimes see it as Where is the Friend's House. Uh, some of the other films in the trilogy have different translations as well. So All Abbas Kiarostami, he's an Iranian director, right? Have we done any Iranian films no, on the... No, yeah, no. so this is a first on the, the podcast. That's right, yeah. And uh, Kiarostami is really... Uh, you may not have heard of him, but he is regarded as one of the greats of world cinema. Uh, directors that you have heard of, such as Akira Kurosawa, had a, a high regard for him. And uh, he kind of, uh, you could say, kind of came up with his own completely unique way of making movies that um, he was certainly inspired by movies, but by other movies and other directors, but it's really kind of his own thing that he's doing, just inspired by life and his own personal philosophy. It's quite unique. Um, So for that reason, I want to talk about his career up through 
these movies that we're specifically going to be di- going to be discussing today. Now, he has many later movies that are perhaps better known that I haven't seen yet, uh, such as A Taste of Ch- A Taste of Cherry and Certified Copy, which when we did our Vatican film list episode, uh, Nathan um, mentioned as one that he would add to some hypothetical future Vatican film list. But this early period of his career is also quite fascinating. I mean, my experience with this director has been that no matter how minor the film that I that I watch by him is, even down to an early film that he made, like educating children about dental hygiene, there's always something fascinating and kind of artistic about the way that he approaches it. So Kiarostami lived from 1940 to 2016 and uh, really started becoming well known uh, on the international scene in the late 80s and 90s. So he was already, you know, a, a in his later middle ages by that time he was he's best known as a filmmaker but he was also a published poet a draftsman uh installation artist he he made chests you know as a carpenter for a while as a sort of a side project um and uh there have been a number of uh sort of well-known iranian directors following after him uh but one thing that sets him apart from some other filmmakers of his time in post-revolution Iran is that he decided to stay in Iran because he felt that somehow staying in his home country was very important to his artistic identity. Um, Although later, like Krzysztof Kieslowski, later in career, made a couple of films outside of his home country. Um, So he starts off as a painter, as an art student, and he starts making commercials. And then where you really want to start paying attention to his career is, I think, in about 1970, he starts, he gets a job working for uh, an, a state founded organization called, uh, which Iranians know as Kanun, which is it's the Center for the Intellectual Development of Children and Young Adults. So basically, he's making films that are either for children in an educational way or they're about children, although not necessarily always for children to watch. And again, you can see a lot of these things on the Criterion channel right now, a lot of his early work from 1970 on. Um, and it's it's just so fascinating the way that he directs children, the whether he's doing documentary, educational cinema, or fictional works. Um, he's always coming up with some kind of fresh perspective on things. Um, and his early focus on children continues up through the film that is my personal favorite so far and which – was the first to sort of break him onto the international scene, which is where is the friend's home. He he makes these sort of educational films and also starts making um, some shorts and then feature length fictional films, uh, all of which are pretty much the fictional ones are pretty much always in the in the realm of kind of what you would call a neo-realist approach. Um, and, and in, insofar as he's using non-professional actors that continues into his later career as well um, to an extent, but, uh, just also just kind of a focus on the everyday lives of ordinary people who are struggling uh, to get by and things like that it has that very neorealist flavor to it. But what's interesting is that once you get to where's the friend's home and the fil- like the four or five films following that, there's like a very clear development from film to film, which then which then builds into his later style that he's more known for, where it's not this kind of this very simple story that's told in the first film of the trilogy, but he's playing with perspective. He's doing meta things. He's blurring the line between fiction and documentary. And he's kind of, um, there's, well, there's a lot of other stylistic traits that develop across these films as well. Um, where's the friend's home, as I mentioned, is a very, is a very simple film. Um, and it's this very simple story. And what makes it powerful, I think is just how, observant it is of small details and how observant it is is of its perspective from a child's perspective now after where is the friend's home he makes a film that we just watched last night called homework now homework is super interesting um because it is a documentary and yet it's already playing with perspective and and looking at the effect that the camera has on people that he's going to continue in both his documentary and his fiction work and his work that merges the two forms. Um, It's basically he goes to this fairly strict kind of uh, Islamic school in Iran, and he just interviews the children about their feelings about homework, their experience of 
who helps them with their homework, whether they're punished or re rewarded, connected with doing their homework properly. And as these children are giving their answers, it constantly is cutting back and forth to the director questioning the children and he's wearing his sunglasses, sort of imposing some sungla sunglasses that he's always wearing and, or to the, the cameraman. So it makes you very aware that the children are very aware of the presence of these adults and specifically of the camera and that that may be affecting the answers they give to their questions. Um, there's also another element that is very common in his films and in Where is the Friend's Home too, which is this element of repetition, just of like building meaning through re repetition. A lot of these children are giving similar answers, but things sort of develop in this repetitive way as he keeps cutting back and forth. And um, it, it's fascinating. It, it's just a completely kind of different way. I don't know if you have anything to say about that film, but it's a, it's a, it's a very unique way of making a documentary. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that I'm glad that we're talking about this trilogy um, because uh, he kind of needs to be considered in the context of his whole body of work. Not that we've seen his whole body of work or that I've seen it, but um, I didn't really start to get a grip on him stylistically until I'd seen several of his films. Right. And that's not always the case with directors. Um, so there's something about Kirastami that's very, um, very singular um, and very hard to describe because he's straddling the boundary between different forms, really, you know. Um, so when he's doing a documentary, you're sometimes not totally certain how much of it is strict documentary and how much of it is also, you know, um, kind of planned or scripted. He's clearly very capable as a director at manipulating situations. And so I think that some some directors are not always honest with themselves about the degree to which the camera and the director and the presence of a of a film crew manipulates, charges a situation, has the ability to sort of, you know, shift things around. And in homework, he's clearly embracing that um, because, and he's showing it to the audience because he has another camera focused on the camera, you know, and he's able to cut to the camera and show us, you know, always reminding the audience, this is a film. These children are being filmed. They're right. interacting with a camera, right. you know, and he, the director being there, you know, able to sort of ask leading questions or follow certain things or, or arrange scenarios. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So already there, you're kind of questioning this, this blurring, this blurred line between fiction and reality, but then that's something that he embraces, you know, very explicitly in the, in this trilogy that we're going to talk about. Right. And then where's the friend's house uh, or where's the friend's home is not, from what I understand, stylistically typical of his later work, it's more in the vein stylistically of his earlier work and and the subject matter of his earlier work. But then as he starts making these films, not only the second and third film of the trilogy, but also the two films that come in between the first and second film of the trilogy, which are homework and close up. Very quickly, he's developing this kind of multi perspective yeah. thing. So I, we talked about homework and you can see that on the Criterion channel. Um, the next film after that is what many critics consider to be his greatest film, which is Close Up in 1990, um, whereas The Friend's Home had been in, in 18, uh, 1987. And uh, now I wouldn't say it's my favorite. I, I have some maybe ethical concerns about the, the way that he blends documentary and fiction in it, but um, it, it leans into that even more. So Homework was a documentary that made you very aware of the perspective of the camera. And then close up is kind of a fiction about the making of a documentary or something. It's hard to describe basically that he had heard about this case, this uh, in which this criminal case in which this, this man had been arrested for impersonating a famous Iranian film director and insinuating himself into the lives of this rich family and convincing him that he was going to cast their children in a film and all of this stuff. Um, and they had loaned him like a small amount of money to get like a very small amount of money to get a taxi. And that's sort of like what he was arrested for. Um, 
And uh, so Kiarostami kind of swooped into that situation and got permission to film the trial. So the trial in the film is the actual trial, but then he also got the the criminal and the family, uh, the, you know, quote unquote victims to reenact the entire thing, like their whole, the way that they met, their interactions, the way that they sort of figured out he wasn't for real, the arrest, all of this stuff. Um, and it's interesting too, because you can see how things build from the homework film into that. Like there's a scene in homework where uh, he shows the children being taught this like religious song, I think in honor of some Islamic martyrs or something out in the schoolyard. And the children are just being kind of unruly and not really paying attention and not singing it properly. And there's this voiceover that comes on that Kiarostami says, uh, because the children were not paying attention, you know, this, this, in order, this um, religious song wasn't able to have its, you know, proper dignity, and therefore, out of respect, we're going to turn the volume off, uh, turn the sound off. So you see the rest of this song sequence in silence, but like it's not really clear if it really is out of respect or if it's there's like some subversion going on here or something like that. Yeah, but I think there's also um, he has this very poetic eye, so he's very attentive to. Um, uh, gestures and you know images, right? Um, and and so by removing the sound for this sequence, he yeah. draws your attention to something visually that yeah. might otherwise have been sort of not not contemplated. Yeah, and he's really attentive to faces, yes. things like that. Yeah, so it's yeah. it's really I I think that you know whether or not he's totally genuine about you know getting rid of the sound out of respect. Um, I think he's clearly, I, you know, my sense is that it's a pretense for drawing our attention to something visually that he wants us to focus on, mm. um, because he just, he just, I'm, 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 I'm going to keep calling him like a master manipulator, but I don't mean that in a negative way per, necessarily, because, you know, we talk about the artist manipulating, you know, his instrument all the time. You know, uh, he's, he's really, the, the painter manipulates the paint brush you know yeah. and the 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 you know musician um you know fingers his instrument yeah the director works with people he works with actors he works with scenarios yeah and um and then he also works with with you know with an audience basically um he frames things and he suggests things and so i think that um that this is another instance where he's he's very skillfully manipulating a situation to bring something out of it you know yeah. that that he wants us to see right and so the reason i brought up that scene in homework is that in the next movie close up near the end and i won't spoil the plot details but there's a scene where you're shooting from the inside of a car that's following two men on a motorcycle and they're having this conversation and it's kind of like an emotional conversation so the sound is cutting in and out and you're missing chunks of the of the exchange that they're having on as they're riding on this motorcycle on the street but as it turns out, the sound wasn't cutting out. What happened is that one of the one of the uh, the people on the motorcycle who is the actual film director that the guy had been impersonating, he was saying stuff that just totally fit. He couldn't hear what the other guy was saying because of the motorcycle. And he was just like babbling on about himself and saying all this stuff that was like totally not fitting to the like the emotion of the situation. Basically, Kirostami just in post cut most of the chunks of what that director was saying out and then put this this voiceover in the film saying oh no our sounds our sounds coming out cutting right, out right so, so yeah so you yeah. see what i mean it's like it would be annoying to an audience if i'm watching a movie and then all of a sudden there's just a sequence with no sound that would just be annoying right um or i'd be sort of taken out of the experience and right. be like well did something go wrong what, what's what's going on you know but because he frames it in well, okay, we're going to remove this sound in the case of homework because this uh, out of respect, and then in the in close up, okay, well, I'm removing this sound because you know it, it what there was a technical difficulty. Well, then now it's all happening in the world of the film, and so I'm not taken out of it, and I'm able to accept it. Right, and so it's like easing me into an experience that he very well may have wanted to have, you know, one way or the other, you know. Yeah, and and so. You know, what's fascinating to me is that, you know, his his documentaries sit right alongside his fictions 
as just this continuous development of his artistic approach. Yeah. And then that gradually sort of merges. Um, and so it's important that you have in between, whereas the friend's home, which is in many ways, a very kind of neorealist type film, then you have homework and close up. And then he makes the second and third movies of what was not initially planned as a trilogy, but sort of just emerged as one, um, which, and the second and third films are, um, and life goes on, which sometimes the title is written as uh, life and nothing more knife life and nothing more. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Life and nothing more. And, uh, the third is uh, Through the Olive Trees. Um, <clears throat> so I want to say also, when I first saw Where is the Friend's Home, it was because uh, I read an NPR interview with Werner Herzog where he mentioned that as one of his favorite movies. And at the time, that was a hard movie to see. Like I had to find somewhere to download it. I think there might have been some out-of-print DVD on Amazon or something. Um, but in, you know, I don't know, a couple of years ago, um, the Criterion Collection put out a, a Blu-ray box set of this Coker trilogy. And so you can buy that and you can also see those films and all these other things we've been talking about by Kirostami on the Criterion channel. Um, so these these films are, especially the first one, are, are much more available uh, to see than they were just a few years ago, yeah. which and is great. All three of the films stand on their own. Uh, but I think that there is something to be gained by watching them as a trilogy in sequential order. Yeah. And I think that whereas the friend's house is a good baseline yeah. for an introduction to Kurosami because it's, it's, it does, while it doesn't involve some of these more sort of cerebral uh, stylistic elements, mm -hmm. um, it does sort of have all these other features that are very characteristic of him, right. which I imagine is what, you know, you, I mean, it's what you responded so strongly yeah. to upon yeah. your first viewing. So, right. um, yeah. So just to quickly, you know, the, 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 the way this trilogy, trilogy develops, you know, setting aside the films that he made in between is whereas the friend's home is this very simple story and life goes on is about a man and his son looking for the two boy actors who were in the first movie um, because there had been an earthquake in the region. And then the third film is basically a story, a dramatic story that is invented in the midst of the shooting of a specific scene in the second film. So it's even more complex, even more meta. So what starts out as this very simple story gets zoomed out and zoomed out and zoomed out until it's quite complex. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, this simple story, uh, whereas the friend's house, you know, it's as standing on its own and it has its sort of its own sort of like, um, you know, themes and considerations. Right. But then it gains like a whole new layer when you view it with reference to these subsequent films. Right. Um, and, and it's because of that meta element, you know, in the second film, this man and his son are ostensibly the director and his son. Right. So uh, Kurostami is sort of, um, uh, he's, he's portraying something that really did happen, which was he and his son went searching for the boy actors right, right after this earthquake. Right. So he, a few months later, he makes a movie about this. Right. So again, it's like, it's the director filming a fictional representation of himself looking for the actual actors that right. in the actual places that he shot this fictional film, right. you know? And then in the third film, there's yet another actor playing the director, but now it's the director filming the second film <laughs> who's, you know, filming a representation of himself, you know, right. it's, it's, it's really quite convoluted. Yeah. But if it sounds like it's difficult to follow, um, that, you know, that, I mean, you'd be forgiven for thinking that, mm -hmm. but it's actually not the case. It, it's these, these films are very accessible yeah. to a general audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, so even though they're very poetic, uh, even though, um, they're very artsy, um, their, their focus is very, it's, they're very humanistic films. And so they're, they're very simple focuses on human characters and human situations, human dramas. So very relatable. Yes. Yes, indeed. So yeah, let's talk about where's the friend's home. Yep. Um, I already told you the, the basic premise of the story and, um, I love this movie's focus on the sort of the, the interior the conscience of a child and his attempts to do the right thing, uh, butting up against, you know, 
the mysteriousness of the world that he's inhabiting, his inability to find, just find this guy's house and asking adults questions and not getting answers. Uh, the confusion of realizing that there are multiple different families with the same last name in this village. You know, all of these very simple things that, you know, present these big obstacles to this child. Um, and it it makes you feel, it really makes you feel that the time and the kind of laborious process for simple things so that you can feel the, the kid's impatience. Um, all of these little details, like when his friend in the schoolyard falls and, uh, you know, gets dirt on his pants and he, he brings him to the fountain and sort of props his leg up to, you know, pull his pants up and, and check on his knee and all of this stuff. It's like, it, it requires an effort. He's like, sort of like fumbling with the kid's pant leg. And there's just like a lack of coordination and all these little things that Hirosami takes his time with that should be tedious, but they just aren't, you know, mm. because they're, they're poetic and they're putting you in the mindset of this child. Um, there's so many beautiful things about perspective where he's going to this, this neighboring village and very often he'll hear a sound of some activity or some voice that's happening off screen and it won't the camera won't show you what it is until he sees it and so there's this very mysterious feeling to it because you know he will he will hear a jingling of bells or he'll hear um you know i don't know what's another example but somebody pouring water or something and he's sort of looking up and trying to see where this is coming from or he's talking to somebody on a bank balcony and a woman on a balcony above him that he can't see uh and things like that and somehow the movie is so effective at staying with his perspective that it gives you this kind of sense of sense of wonder but also sense of like frustration at times and then also the repetition of him trying to tell the adults the problem that he's trying to solve or asking where somebody's house is. And most of them just don't have the time time of day for him because they're wrapped up in their own concerns. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's just, just, I love one of the beautiful things to me about it is just how, how completely it inhabits this child's perspective. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like there was a time when, you know, crossing the street and going to the opposite block was like a grand adventure, mm -hmm. you know? And I think a lot of people relate to that. Mm. And so while this boy probably enjoys, you know, a greater degree of independence just by virtue of, of his circumstances and, and the necessities of his life, um, this rural, you know, essentially peasant life out in, uh, you know, rural Iran, um, I think people can still relate to how, from the perspective of a child, even sort of a a sort of uh, simple thing can become a great adventure. Right. And uh, and so there is this sort of this odyssey quality to the film. Um, this you know there and back again, a, a Hobbit's tale kind of uh, <laughs> element. Right. Um, uh, but then also, yeah, it's it, the things that he sees. You know, sometimes you can see how I, I think when he first gets to the neighboring village of Poshte, um, he sees somebody carrying if I'm remembering correctly, like carrying like a load of, of, of sticks or something. Yeah, yeah. And it, it almost looks like a moving bush, right. you know? And, and so the first impression is something that's quite fantastical right. or grotesque. And yeah. then the man comes into view in the frame and, and, you know, now, but you can see how a child might interpret that, you know, with alarm or something, you know, that there's, right. there's a kind of mystique that's cast over everything um, because of this child's perspective that's caught so, so, you know, so well, but also so subtly by the camera, right. you know, it's not like Kiarostami is, is, you know, playing any tricks on us. Um, it's really just the way that he frames things um, and, and the sort of the, the rhythm of the film that suggests this child's perspective to us and not some sort of like, you know, special effects or something. Right. And one of the most uh, suspenseful scenes in the film is when he goes to the house of this family that has the last name of the kid that he's looking for. And he, uh, <laughs> that the, the son of the, the father on the donkey that he's been following uh, is the guy, the guy makes doors. And so he's carrying this door out to be put in uh, on his father's donkey to be carried back. And the, 
all you see is this door with turn on its side with legs with this little kid carrying it, but he's behind the door and you can't see if it's going to be the right kid. And so you have to wait so long just to find out and you can feel the suspense of it. So I love that all these little moments are given such suspense yeah. and, and that suspense and that excitement is, is amplified by the tediousness and the, the tedium and the frustration of all these repeated attempts that mm-hmm. you can see the kid having to run run to the other village and then run back home and then run back to the other village again because they were just there, but they left and right. uh, all of this stuff. Yeah. And, and it also just, it's so um, reflective of his documentary style because uh, you know, despite the fact that this is, this is a, f- a fiction and they're working from a script, they're working with non-actors, they're shooting on location and there is this, you know, really authentic feel to all of the, scenarios and and right. um interactions yeah um so like take for instance it opens in the classroom and the man who is you know playing the school teacher is the local school teacher right you know and these are all the the children who go right. to school there right, right. um so so yeah so so again there's this this blurring of of what's documentary and of what's or you know, it's it's not in a blurring so much as it is. A it's skillful, the near realist thing of of non professional actors, and and it's a skillful manipulation of the material. You right. know, um, so so he uses it well. And I also want to say too about the visual style. I mean, um, there are picturesque images. There's beautifully framed shots. There's some really unique visuals that recur in the next two films, such as this zigzag path going up the hill, which seems to sort of, it seems to sort of reflect this kind of, this kind of striving and this kind of tedious work to get to your goal. Um, But so much of the visual interest of the film is just because of how thoroughly it inhabits the perspective of the character and what it tells you about the perspective of the character. Like it does, it does look nice, but what's interesting is the things that he isn't showing you as well. And the, the the visual suspense, you know, in that sense, rather than just the suspense of any the beauty of any one individual shot. Yeah. Um, but we should talk too about the kind of the the social morality of the film too. Uh, I, I think one interesting thing to notice is that well, this is a film about a friendship. You know, it's right there in the title, and this kid doesn't live in his same village. He's the kid that he sits next to in his class, and he has sympathy for his situation because he's always getting in trouble. Um, But uh, you get the sense that the adults in the movie, for the most part, really don't care about anybody who's not related to them. You know, like when he's trying to tell his mother that he has an obligation to give this kid his workbook back because he he needs it and he's the one who took it. She just doesn't have any time for that. She's concerned about him getting his chores and his homework done, her getting her chores done. And anything that's outside of that, like narrow ambit, is not of interest to her. Um, And so it's interesting that from the child's perspective, you have this ability to look outside of these immediate practical needs and to look at somebody who is not part of your sort of your narrow circle and attend to their needs, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think another aspect to it is just the difficulty with which adults sympathize with the concerns of children. Right. Um, So I think it's all too easy to sort of like cavalierly dismiss what might feel very important to a child, but from an an adult's perspective is a non-issue. Now... You know, this happens again with the when he encounters sort of like the elders of the village right. um, who sent him on this menial task as basically just like an arbitrary act of of of, you know, d- demanding deference, you know, yeah, and, he tells and him to go get a cigarette. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and uh, he acknowledges even that it's it's just to sort of teach him respect. Right. But this is but this is, you know, what it, putting aside the legitimate concerns or or not of of this elder um about instilling respect in the next generation um it just demonstrates like such an an obvious inability to actually attend to what is concerning this child right now you know right. um and so so i think that there's that and then i think also 
Um, <clears throat> Kirostami seems to be interested in the disconnect that happens between home and school. Yes. You know, where yes. children spend their time, where they're taught and educated, where they make friendships, where they're disciplined, and then where they have to navigate a whole other hierarchy of, of you know, uh, of uh, um, tasks and characters. Um, right, because you get the impression he barely has time to do his homework because he gets, keeps getting interrupted by go – give the baby some water and, right. and things like that. And we that. see other students who similarly, you know, have to work in the fields with their father, right. um, you know, who might have illiterate parents. Um, and yet they have a teacher, you know, saying, no, your your responsibility is to your studies first, and then you can help work on the farm. Right. Um, and so, you know, right. it's it, the parents might not see things that way. And this is all coming out of Kiarostami's interest and his concern and his work on the education of yeah. children, you know, but it's just kind of amazing because you, you also gain a, an appreciation for just how powerless children are, how much they are dependent upon the whims, um, and, uh, priorities of the adults around them. Right. Um, so, so at the end of the day, uh, this child has to really just, just depend on. Yeah. And the adults, adults aren't, the adults are not trying to coordinate with the even coordinate with each other to make sure that they're not giving conflicting messages. So right. the grandfather, uh, you know, wants him to get his cigarettes, but he's supposed to go get bread for his parents, right. you know, and all of this stuff. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so it, it just becomes very complicated to perform these <laughs> yes. simple, these simple tasks. And, you know, the, the film brings this grandfather character in and he's talking about how, you know, when he was a boy, his father would give him an allowance you know, every week and beat him every week or something like that, or every two weeks and beat him every week. And sometimes he would forget to give the allowance, but he would never forget, forget to give the beating. And the other old man is like, well, what if you hadn't done anything wrong? And he was like, well, he beat me anything just so I'd learn, or I forget what he says, something yeah. like that. Um, and so there's sort of this critique of the, the old ways, but it's also that same time you get this scene with this, this door salesman, who's being really pushy and trying to get these old men to buy a new door. And they're like, my door is perfectly fine. I'm an old man. I'm not going to need a new door for the rest of my life. And he's making all these kind of specious arguments. Um, and then later we meet kind of the one adult who really does, you know, listen to uh, our main character, who is this old, this other old door maker, this other window and door, you know, craftsman. And the way that he's introduced is very beautiful because he's in this kind of dark alley. And then suddenly these colored lights, almost as if from like a rose window in a cathedral, appear uh, on the wall above him. And it becomes this like magical environment because this, you know, this this window opposite ha has been opened and these these things that this old man is making are shining through. Um, and then you get that simultaneous frustration at the slowness of things, but you also get this old man who's, who's not in a hurry. And the other adults are all kind of with the exception of the, I guess the, the, I guess the other, the grandfather, but many of them are kind of too much in a hurry to listen. And this old man is, is simultaneously teaching the boy patience and having to follow his slow walk because he's going to show him where the friend's house is. But he's also teaching him some wisdom and he's listening to him and he's talking to him about real things. Yeah. And he's talking to him about how he doesn't understand why, you know, everybody wants to move the city and nobody wants to have beautiful things that last for a long time anymore. People don't seem to have a use for his craftsmanship. They're replacing them with, you know, shoddier, right. less beautiful things. Right. And, and, and the things like that, that he makes are very beautiful. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you, you immediately, it, it becomes immediately apparent that this character sort of represents more than what he is, you know, right. especially because he's talking about these sort of bigger picture, you know, waxing philosophical or poetic, um, you know, about the way things are going. Right. Um, so you do kind of feel like, like, an encounter with the wise old man in, yes. in, in, at the at the edge of the forest or something, um, or or like something out of a fairy tale, like like a Geppetto uh, or or something. Right. Um, uh, you know, um, I think it's also significant that this is 
at the end of the day too when night descends and it's becoming windy and spooky and there's dogs barking and he says i'll keep an eye on you right as he goes off it's like gandalf leaving the company at the edge of the uh yeah. the forest but then also know? like the lighting becomes much more kind of surreal almost in the the shadows that are cast and the 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 designs that we can see in the window frames yeah. and so um there's there's kind of a uh uh it's it all gets to be a lot more um yeah i've used this word already fantastic or 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 dreamlike you know in this final right. sequence of the film yeah yeah and um this this old man of course he gives him a flower that he finds uh and puts it in the notebook and i you assume it's kind of forgotten about but then you get this kicker when he just manages he he ends up having to do the other child's homework for him because he never finds his house that's kind of like the frustration of the film he never finds the friend's house but he goes home he presumably gets a beating from his father it seems to be sort of implied and he does the, ch- the other boy's homework for him because what else is he going to do? And he makes it in time before the teacher checks the work. And when the teacher opens the book to the page, there's this flower pressed in. Yeah. That's like the ending shot. And it's one of the most famous shots in Iranian cinema. Yeah, and and but, it's just this – you come away with this like such – this jubilant feeling. Well, and you know? one of the things that makes that work so well is the use of music. And right. this is something that recurs throughout all of the, the films of his that I've seen right. is just like an expert use of music. Um in in the storytelling uh so that that final sequence yeah. would not work nearly as well if the music didn't just like hit at the right moment with right. just the right vibe right. you know right yeah and this this flower it sort of rep- represents this kind of this general this added layer of generosity or gratuity because at first he's just trying to give the friend his notebook back then he ends up having to do the homework for him and then the the flower appears like this extra gift that they, you know, the other kid certainly doesn't know, you know, where it came from. Yeah. And uh, it's just like it came from this older perspective, this wiser perspective of this old man who makes beautiful things. And also you know? from this odyssey that he went yeah. on, this yeah. whole, this transformative journey. So even though on the surface it may seem like a disappointment that he didn't just he couldn't just find his friend's house. Right. Um that actually he found something else and he brings it back like the golden fleece, you know. Um <laughs> right. uh you know in the in the form of this flower. And it feels like there's this seed of something more beautiful and generous that's planted in the lives of these two boys Mm -hmm. you know yeah um so it's a very powerful final image right um so that leads us really nicely into the next film because the next film you know is about trying to find these two boys right and not the characters that they played but then they they themselves right and you know incidentally the characters they played were themselves. Um, they they right. Have the, the friends in the film are brothers in real life, right? But they, they have the same names uh, in the but film as in real life. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, interesting. Which is funny. Um, so so uh, so you know we have a fictional representation of the director of Where Is the Friend's House, who is also played by a non actor. He's just an economist that Kurosami <laughs> met at a party. Yeah, and yeah. and a fictional representation of the director's son. Yes, uh, you know off on this this a new odyssey yes. to try to find these children in the wake of a devastating uh it was an earthquake, earthquake. in 1990 that killed like 50,000 people yeah um and the yeah. film was shot a few months after the earthquake so you would imagine there had been a good deal of of you know rebuilding and sort of regrouping right. and yet you know Kiarostami is able to get a lot of shots of the devastation right. that are you know clearly this is a this is a building that was destroyed by this earthquake Right, 
تازه می رفتی کلاس اول از درس و مش راحت شد شما هم اون داستان شنیدین همونی که حضرت ابراهیم میخواست پسرش رو بکشه ها اول میخواسته پسرش رو بکشه با شمشی خدا فرمان داده که خدا گفته که برو پسر رو بکش این که رفته شمشیش رو ورده که او برده درده شکم پسرش یا او باسهش یک گوسمند رو بردن که اونو بکشه به جای پسرش اون وقت میاد دختر افزلی شما رو بکشه که تازه زندگیش رو شروع کرده تازه من فکر میکنم که اگه همه میموردن باز دوباره به دنیا میامدن قدر زندگی رو بیشتر میدونستن تازه همین بچه هاتونم که زنده موندن قدر زندگی رو بیشتر میدونم این حرف را تو از کجا یاد گرفتی؟ نسوشو از تاریخ یا گرفتم نسوش آقای روحی گفته نسوشم خودم You know, you don't need to have seen Where is the Friend's House to watch this film. Um, there might be some callbacks that you don't you don't get the same sort of satisfaction out of right. um, if you haven't seen the first film. Um, but I think the biggest thing missing is the kind of uh, the the concern um, that one would naturally feel for these two boys if you've seen the first film, right, you know? Right. Um, so clearly the director is very concerned about these boys. Abbas Kiarostami was very concerned about these children after right. news of the earthquake. Right. Um, and so um, so that is kind of like the framing uh, dilemma. Yeah. Where, where are these children? <laughs> and in its own way, this is a simple film too. Uh, it's not a plot heavy film by any means. It's there's some important developments that are parts of his style going forward, which is a this is a car movie. It's a road trip. A mm -hmm. lot of it is conversation that takes place in a car or looking for people on car, trying to find the right road, getting rerouted, all of this stuff that apparently is uh, a big part of his later films as well. Um, but uh, the the visual style is very kind of. Um, more landscape oriented. You get these big, wide landscape shots. Sometimes the characters proceed, you know, deep into the shot or the car or whatever. And uh, these sort of very geometrical landscape features that he finds. Um, and then uh, the use of music too. Suddenly you have this Western music in the film. You have Vivaldi being used in the second and, and believe the third film right. is Vivaldi as well. Right. But there's also this continuity of the setting and the characters that they're looking for, yes. the actors they're looking for from the first movie. Yes. And he's able to retain the child's perspective in this film um, because, yes, right. you know, it's a father and his son. And so right. sometimes we're seeing things from the father's perspective. Other times we're seeing things from the child's perspective. Um, and so there's similar devices that are used. There's some delightful moments where the child is interacting with someone, you know, uh, through the car window and the camera can't see, you know, past this window, almost like the child can't see past this window. Right. Um, and so there, there's this play with, with what's shown, what isn't. Yeah. Um, but there's also a development of the perspective because now we have moments, a lot of moments when we're sitting with, with the father, the director sort of thinking on his work, you know, thinking on his work and, and the people that his work has touched, right. um, the, the, the community that has been affected, yeah. um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and on his child. So we're being invited into the perspective of Kurostami himself, you know, and, right. and the multiple perspectives that he's, he's inhabiting when he's shooting a movie right. and in the aftermath. So it's a very fascinating Right. Uh, perspective to invite the audience yeah. into. And this movie too is also about kind of an endless search and there's even less resolution in this one than in the previous one. Um, although there's still, there's still hope. Um, but it's also very much about the importance of detours like the, you know, happened in the first one, you yeah. know, and what you learn and the people that he meets and the stories that he hears about how people are coping with the devastation. And that's where the title of the movie comes from is this idea that, uh, you know, in the film, people have the, the, the earthquake was five days ago and the people are coping and they're living and they're making their tea and they're trying to watch the World Cup because what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, like they've it's like they've lost so many people. You know, one of the characters says he's lost 65 relatives. It's like they've lost so many people that 
it would be they are doing mourning rituals and stuff but it would be impossible to just adequately mourn yes you know the devastation yeah. and so they just have to live yeah and they have these practical duties especially of the kind that you know if you're a rich person then you can just sit around in your house and mourn but mom who just lost her oldest daughter uh has to do laundry yeah you know at the the spring yeah you know yeah yeah it's very beautiful um and you know you have this precocious child who's always asking questions in his childlike way um and and sort of information uh being brought out through this right. mechanism. But then you also have the director who asks questions in his very attentive, uh, you know, humanistic way. So so you begin, Kiarostami is, is letting us into something of his own practice as a filmmaker, which is more, more apparent in, in, you know, a film like Homework, right. where you see him there questioning the children in real time. Right. But here we have a representation of, of how Kiarostami is able to to um, elicit from his subjects right. um, the good stuff. Right. You know, um, uh, one of my acting instructors once uh, told us um, to be interesting, you just have to be interested. Hmm. And that, that it's, it's like in this taking interest in what's in front of you that, that you're able to actually find, generate, and, and, and also exhibit, you know, interesting elements yourself um so so um so i was thinking about that a lot watching this because what we really get is a whole sequence of seeing this director you know just taking interest in the people that are in front of him and in the situations right and and it's an interest that we know is not passing because it's something that stays with him such that in the wake of a of a you know, catastrophe like this, he will actually go out with his son and try to find these children. You right. know, that's, that's his interest is out there, right. you know, and it's not a merc mercenary interest like, Oh, I'm going to be able to make a good movie out of this, right. but it is what he ends up making a good movie out of. Right. So it's, it's like, right. yeah, it's this, this, you know, be interested and you'll be interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um the use of music is interesting, kind of startling to me in this film. There's this scene where he comes over this ridge and he sees these people involved in sort of funeral dirges of some kind. And it's this sort of like it's it sort of hits hard. And you've got this sort of like mournful, eerie sound of these women wailing and chanting and stuff. And then suddenly that just fades into the background and this like very nostalgic, pleasant Vivaldi music just takes over. Yeah. And it's sort of sort of this odd like juxtaposition or it something is. it feels it almost detached but it's so um, it's so perfect too i mean there's there's never any sense whenever a music whenever a piece of music comes in that this is sort of haphazard mm -hmm. or imprecise um there's always this sense that this is being very particularly chosen and that it evokes like just the right mood mm -hmm. for what kirostami is after um so, you know, uh I, I I can't I can't quite remember that that specific moment enough to to elaborate more, but I just know that every time the music came on mm -hmm. in any of these movies, it just always felt so perfect, uh in a way that Well, why not... do you think he brought that piece of music into that? I mean that movie that music recurs in the film, so yeah. why what do you think that's doing in there? Uh, you know, again, I only watched this movie once and I I, I can't I I don't remember exactly what what you know it was doing to me, uh -huh. but I know that it had to do with you know everything from uh, the the liveliness of the melody to the rhythm. You know, there's like in this Vivaldi pieces, there's like a very sharp rhythm and a rhythm that changes a lot, and so mm -hmm. he's able to move with that in the 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 scenes um you know i think the best example of this is right at the end where the final shot of this film is him in the car by himself he's left his son with the the sort of the community to watch this uh soccer game and he's going to head on to try to find these these children um and he's struggling to get his car up this really tall hill you know kind of evoking the imagery of of this hill that we see the zigzag hill yeah. you know in, in where is the friend's house um but but uh he he doesn't he stalls out and the car just slowly descends backwards <laughs> yeah and and even goes out of frame just as the music is sort of like fading out 
And then the music picks back up again and the car is coming right. back again. And you're like, yes, you know, there's yeah. this, this visceral, yeah. like, oh yeah. You know, it just, it hits just like that, that flower hits at the end of where's the yeah. friend's house. And, and it's, it's suggestive of the theme of, uh, of the, the, of the name of this film, you know, it's like, and life goes on. It's that in the face of defeat, you know, Try, try again. You know, and why do you think like, he takes that big, that really detached, distant perspective on that final scene? Um, well, we you should, mean just like pulled back really yeah, far? Yeah, yeah, Like, well, we, we, we should say too, there's this guy carrying like a gas tank or something up yeah. the hill and he, uh, you know, the guy just... He can't, he can't pick him up because he's trying to get up this hill on right. his own. And, and if he slows down, he's going to yeah. lose the speed that he needs and he's definitely going to stall out. Yeah. Well, he stalls out anyway. The guy pushes the car and then he goes away. Yes. And then he comes back. By that time, the guy is up, mostly up the hill, but then he picks him up on his way up. Yeah. At the end. So yeah. There's this nice solidarity that happens much like in Where's the Friend's Home. Right. But why do you think that that whole thing happens at such a such a distance? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's these little figures in this in the screen. It's cool that it's able to unfold in one take or one shot, you know, um, mm. that uh, it's it's a long shot. Right. And so, um, in you both know, senses. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's nice that that uh, that you know, it's able to contain all of this drama in the single shot um, and play out in real time. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that, you know, maybe there's a sense in which it it sort of, uh, in in taking us away from the specific sort of perspective of, of any one of these, these figures, you know, if we were in the car, you know, just trying to get up this hill, mm -hmm. that becomes a more, you know... Uh, um uh more more sort of individualistic um experience that yeah. we're being brought into whereas this big picture detached perspective lends it a kind of epic quality where it can mm. be representative of a lot more you know it's it's symbolic uh potency is able to to reverberate a little bit more right right just like going up the zigzag hill you know, towards that that single tree uh -huh. at the top of the hill. You know, I think Kiarostami has the sensitivity to to you know these landscape compositions that he creates and 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 what that suggests. You know, there's like a kind of rom there's a there's a romantic quality to right. you know a landscape is beautiful, and then as soon as you put a person in it, it's romantic. Right. You know, um, <laughs> right. uh, and so. So, so, um, I think that that's probably what's going on there. Yeah. So that, that ends the film, right. you know, that's the final gesture. They make it over the hill and then it's ending credits. And so we don't, we don't get to find, you know, does he ever reach the, the, the children? Are they okay? Right. Um, we have reason to be hopeful, but, um, but there is a kind of dissatisfying quality, you know, right. on, on a narrative level. Yeah. Um, and yet Kiarostami is trying to direct our attention to something else. What do you think of him being separated from his son at the end of the film? Uh, I mean, the, just there's, uh, I think, again, um, there's, in the same way that this child in Where's the Friend's House enjoys a greater degree of, of independence and freedom than we might otherwise be comfortable with, certainly mm. in a place like New York City. Right. Um, I think, you know, this 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 director knows this community. He trusts this community. There's a social um cohesion that he can count on. Mm -hmm. Um I think that leaving the child behind allows us to just focus our attention on the director's perspective in these final moments, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and it sort of upgrades the concerns of the film to a more, um, like, yeah, a more adult, uh, uh, perspective and, and concern, you know, um, because children, children are going to, let's put it this way. And life goes on is a very evident, um, precept for a child right not so much for for an adult you know mm -hmm. um that's something that needs to be grappled with a little bit more in your older years than than it does i think for for a child uh -huh. right i mean we're 
we're we're devastated when any anybody gives up on life. Right. But especially so if it's a child. There's something like very perverted if that happens, right. you right. know? Right. Um and, and it almost seldom does. Right. Um we're less we're less shocked if it's mm-hmm. an adult who's given up, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah. So well, my favorite uh, callback from this to the pr- first movie is when the he picks up the old man who played the nice old man in the first movie. Yeah. And <laughs> he's talking about his experience filming the first movie. And he says, uh, you know, how they made him look older and they gave him a hunchback and stuff. And he says, what kind of art makes people look older than they are? Art is what art is when you make someone look a little younger and better than they <laughs> really do. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. And it's just like a, a good symbol of like probably all of the arguments that he has had to have make with you know non-actor actors right, right. in the course of well and we films. see we see those arguments played out you know uh very explicitly in the next film yeah through the olive trees from 1994 <laughs> Oh, <laughs> بیسواد <laughs> Uh, we won't have as much time to talk about this because we're running out of time, but uh, it begins with the, the, I think maybe the one professional actor in this trilogy who plays the director of both previous films, I guess. No, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he begins with the actor who's playing the director announcing to to, to the, the camera, camera. That he's going to be playing the director of the film, which is helpful because otherwise it would be very confusing. Yeah. Um, so we've got, like you said, two different actors playing the director. We've got the actor who's playing the director on the journey in the second film and then the actor who's playing the director who shot the second film. Right. Uh, and this whole thing is about this kind of love story and this drama that emerges in the shooting between two actors in the shooting of one scene from the second film. Yeah. And yeah. this is where we really get all kinds of different perspectives. He's reshooting shots from the second film. I mean, they didn't actually make this while they were making the second film. Yeah. So he's going back. He's getting right. the people. He's reshooting the shots. You're seeing multiple takes. And again, it's this repetition that could be very tedious, but somehow in his hands is fascinating. And again, too, um, it's born of a real experience he had while shooting that second film, right. which was he noticed the, this young couple, these two young actors, non-actors, you know. They're as, playing a married couple. Who are playing a film. newly married couple, but they had a real tension on set. Right. And this interested him. And 
and and it's sort of from this experience that he crafts a new story. So right. the story's fictional, but again, he's using the same actors. Well, not the the woman, but in this case, but the young man who was in the second yeah. film, uh, you know, who had tension with this uh this, you know, woman he's acting opposite. Right. Um He's he's reprising that role here, right. but and now that playing... young man had been a T boy right. on the set and was last minute drafted to act in the previous movie because the, of the other guy messing yes. up his lines, yes, which yes. is what you see so, happening here. So yeah, you know, it's like I mean, at the risk of bogging this down in a lot of minutia, there is something that's really delightful in how these films overlap and how um, uh, things come to the seemingly come to the surface for Kiristami. You know, it's right. like things are just just given to him to work with. And of course, we know that's not how it works. Um, it takes an attentive eye and an artistic heart to discover these these threads and mm -hmm. bring them together. But that seems to be what Kiarostami himself is reflecting on in making these films. So that you could look at it on the one hand and see it as a sort of like narcissistic ego trip where he's like sort of looking at himself and holding himself up as this master manipulator but you could also look at, at look at it as someone who is who is making explicit the 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 process the practice the way these things sort of come to him right. um and i think if you're hip you recognize that um that there's actually a great humility in this right. you know that that someone who's on an ego trip might try to mask that you know, and not right. make it so evident. Um, but he's he's taking himself as a subject. There's a there's a it's it's there's a self consciousness that um, that I think is you know that's very that's very truthful. Um, uh, and I yeah I so appreciate it in these films, but also in the documentary work. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's uh, yeah it's just it's just fascinating. I think that this one also succeeds in just the fact that it's a love story, right? You know, um, that's, that, that's a hook that's going to catch a lot of people. Right. So I think that, you know, uh, if you were going to only watch one film, um, you might consider just watching this one hmm. because it's got all of the weird stylistic things, meta things that are going on, right. but it also just really hooks you in with yeah. this this love story. It's, and whereas the second one is quite uneventful and slow, this one is a lot more complex and has a lot more action in it yes. and yes. a lot of humor. But if you really want to treat yourself to the Kirostami treatment, right. um, begin with Where's the Friend's House and work through yeah. all three of these. Right. And that's my favorite. That's my favorite. It's In terms of the themes and stuff, that's the one that moves me the most. I think you can't go wrong. Um, I, if I was going to say you were just going to watch one of these three films, I would say go with the first one or the last one. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think that you are, you know, a more daring uh, uh, cinema uh, viewer, I might say go with the last one uh -huh. because there's going to be more for you to chew on there. Right. Um, but uh, uh, or maybe maybe not. <laughs> right. It's just a lot of delightful stuff. I mean, the the character of Mrs. Shiva, the director's assistant, oh, yeah. who has to go around and wrangle this actor, these actors, especially this young woman who is trying to wear the dress that she wants to wear instead of the peasant dress that she's supposed to wear yeah. for the shoot. And Mrs. Shiva just cuttingly sarcastic. It's great. When the actors aren't. You know, I <laughs> love it. I, I love it whenever a, there's a movie about making movies. Uh -huh. You know, there's something very delightful about that. But again, we have the camera shooting the camera right you know so you see uh and are always being reminded of 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 the reality of film you know because yeah. where where so much of film is about trying to get you to forget the artifice you know trying to again yeah trying to mask it so that it it feels real and you don't find, you're not taken out um but uh but i so appreciate it when a director isn't limited by that and is able to sort of embrace the artifice and draw our right. attention to it. Right. You know? And he does give us the, our, satis our fan service of seeing the two boys yes. that we didn't get to see yes. in the, the second movie yeah. in a very non dramatic way, just right. sort of a. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> it's satisfying, kind of you know, and he knows seven what he's doing. Seven there years too. after the first movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the film ends even more from the perspective, you know, of the director you know, uh, in this film, because we've got the young man, the director is kind of, he's not only manipulating the, the, the shooting, but he's also manipulating 
he's setting up the shoot and the actors so that this kid will have a chance with this girl whose whose family is rejecting mm-hmm. him. And so the, we, the, 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 he sends him off to follow her at the end of the shoot to to try to convince her to give him an answer. And so we get this long monologue by him towards her with her not responding. But then the director follows after them and is sort of gazing down at them and seeing him run after her through mm-hmm. this field. And again, we get an, a hugely, a way, way, way long shot mm-hmm. and some drama that happens with these minuscule figures. Mm-hmm. And um, another, you know, great use of music. Yes. And and just an, a masterful um, sense of timing, you know, um, Every every director needs to to have a sense of rhythm, yeah. you know. Um, but I think that uh, Kurostami, his pacing and his his yeah his sense of timing is just so m- much his own and spot on. You know, it's everything hits really well when he wants it to hit, even with like understated moves like when to bring these children back, you know, into the frame. Like even that that sort of that that nonchalant uh again through the side window of the car right it's still it's it, it works you know it works and and you know he knows that it works right um so so i think that kurostami is a really excellent um example of the auteur you know mm-hmm. i think that that uh if you are someone who's sort of just getting into cinema He's an excellent case study for the auteur director because his choices are so evident mm. um, while also so satisfying and able to be appreciated. Right. You know, and and they reward you when you go into them and begin to ask questions of like, why this or why that? Um, but they don't sort of throw up any obstacle to your immediate enjoyment because right. they're still very accessible. Yeah. So, I yeah, I think that, uh, you know, um people shouldn't be cowed by oh this like you know this this director i've never heard of you know from iran um and he's doing all this meta stuff right. you know actually these films are very accessible they're very enjoyable uh heartwarming entertaining humane um and uh and um but but also are very very great artistic merit here right. and and ability to there's they offer the, the an opportunity to really appreciate the director as the author of a work of art you know yeah, yeah. and i'm glad we've talked about his early career because i'm sure we'll do at least one more episode about this director since nathan mentioned certified copy and we'd like to go back and look at some of these films that were mentioned in Definitely. the Vatican film list recap so uh i think i think we'll we'll go back and um, I think I'll probably I'll probably just tackle the rest of his filmography in in order because I found it very rewarding to do things mostly in order with him and see the development. Sure, especially sure. in this early the first two decades of his career. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, uh, I'm glad I, I watched this movie a bunch of times over the years and only now just finally saw the second and third one. So I'm happy to have finally seen a bit more. Yeah, I'm, and you you weren't disappointed. No, I wasn't. I mean, the first is definitely my favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I you've just seen the first one like seven or eight times or something. Right? I would say four or five. Really? Only yeah, that yeah. much? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Okay. I think so interesting. I think I think four. Okay. Yeah, like I said, everything I've seen by him is fascinating. You can go on the Criteria. Cha- you can go on the Criterion Channel and watch. Uh, you know, even the 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 dental hygiene film yeah. where <laughs> it's just a dentist talking to the screen with a young boy moaning in the background as they're working on his teeth, just like that. And then the sort of the montage that he gives where the young man's <laughs> teeth are fixed and he can go around, run around the playground and bite an apple again. It's just hilarious. Yeah, and there's um, he has some amazing children's um uh films too that I, we've shown to to our children um one in particular called colors which yeah. is just like this really intense like montage of very vibrant colors together with you know this voiceover of a woman saying the colors and saying the things that that are on the screen right um and it's it's but it, it all it ends up taking these kind of these detours yeah. into very imaginative places. Yes, yes. It breaks it breaks away from this formula that it establishes. Yeah, yeah. Brendan yeah. really loves it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. 
Good. Yeah. Well, everybody, uh, hope you enjoyed this. Hope you check out uh, one of these films. And again, you can see all of those on the Criterion channel or get the Blu-ray from the Criterion collection to watch those. Uh, I'm glad we live in this time when these movies are accessible to yeah. Western audiences. Yeah. Honestly, um, the Criterion channel is the only streaming service worth subscribing to <laughs> right, right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody, if you'd like to check out uh, more of Catholic Culture's stuff, uh, yes, I said stuff. I'm not afraid to say we have stuff. Uh, go to catholicculture.org slash newsletter and consider signing up for one of our uh, email newsletters to get updated on all of our fresh stuff. <laughs> fresh, right. fresh stuff. God bless you, and we will see you next time. Criteria is a production of catholicculture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Jim Papandrea, Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings, and the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical resources, and much more at catholicculture.org. <laughs>